Yes. All the participants. YouTube. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon, all the participants and viewers. I welcome all of you to the third session of our international webinar series. I now request Ms. Sandhya Panikar to take over as the today's moderator for the session. Sandhya. Thank you, Jyoti. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us. Third day of our international webinar series on secret treasures in plant science. Today we have two eminent speakers amongst us. During the session, we have Dr. Shwati Majumdar and Dr. Sam Kumar Masakpali. We cordially welcome the speakers. Now I request Ms. Jayanti D, Assistant Professor. Department of Botany, Mount Carmel College, in groups our first speaker of today's session. What do you, ma'am? Thank you very much, Sandhya. I feel very proud to introduce the first speaker of the day on our international webinar series on secret treasures in plant sciences. Dr. Shuvati Majumdar, a student of famous biologist Dr. D. K. Singh, who was one of the pioneers who started, studied, and worked on primitive bryophytes. After completion of his degree from an MSc Botany from the University of Calcutta, he began his research career in Botanical Survey of India as Senior Research Fellow and Senior Research Fellow under the leadership of Dr. D. K. Singh. For his project, Tour of India on taxonomic studies of the Spaghetti and Anthocerate of Anjwar district, Arunachal Pradesh, which also was his area and title of PhD degree. Dr. Shuvadeep Majumdar has also worked in Hypofax project under MOEF. Dr. Shuvadeep Majumdar has published many research articles of about 29 and four communicated papers in both national and international reviews, uh, peer reviewed journals, particularly in the area of liverwort and Markansu Paisa. Dr. Shuvadeep Majumdar's research has eventually increased the checklist of bryophytes in India. Many species of bryophytes have been added into bryophyte flora such as Radula, Cagiocelion, Cagiocelionia, Bazania, Jabula, Hachisie, etc. He also is the first reporter of Anastrophilum Lignicola from Arunachal Pradesh of the Himalayas of India and also reported new genus in liverwort called Udaria. Dr. Shuvadeep Majumdar has also proposed new superphylum called Monosporangiophyta, grouping Markansiophyta, Bryophyta and Anthocerophyta and he has also recognized for many new uh, national and regional bryophyte records to India. Dr. Shuvadeep Majumdar is recipient of prestigious award to name Young Scientist Award of SCRB National Post Doctoral Fellow by Science and Engineering Research Board and Department of Science and Technology, Government of India in the year 2019. And also International Travel Scheme by Science and Engineering Research Board under Department of Science and Technology, Government of India, attending the International Botanical Congress, which is held in China. Dr. Shuvadeep Majumdar was also invited as research person for many programs such as Biodiversity Conservationist Course under Green Skill Development Program, organized by MOEF and Climate Change. Annual Biodiversity Camp conducted by the Doctorate of Forest Directorate of Forest and Government of West Bengal in Botanical Survey of India. Dr. Shuvadeep Majumdar currently working as Assistant Professor in Department of Botany, uh, Parimal Mitra Smriti Mahavishwa Vidyalay, West Bengal. The passion of Dr. Shuvadeep on bryophytes is definitely admirable and inspirational by looking at this uh, looking at this 
young career that he has We wish Dr. Shuvadeep the best for his career and all his future endeavors. Thank you very much, sir. I now request Dr. Shuvadeep to take over his presentation. Thank you, madam, for your uh, elaborate uh, uh, introduction. So, I just... So, one minute, sir. I want to just interrupt. I'm getting a lot of background noises. Teachers and uh, all the speakers present on MS team, please kindly check and mute. There's a lot of uh, noise coming. Please uh, kindly check and mute yourself. Uh, sir, you can now proceed. <laughs> Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks for your kind words. And uh, uh, another thing means I want to, uh, I'm very pleased that you have invited me to say a few words on uh, biophytes. So I, uh, without wasting any time, I just quickly go on to my uh, presentation. So here is my uh, topic, uh, collection, preservation, identification, and diversity of monosporangiophyta. Means I want to emphasize first what is monosporangiophyta. What we have been uh, teaching, yes, means, uh, long back it was bryophytes. And now a uh, new concept has come, uh, it has been proposed by me only, that it is uh, monosporangiophyta. The concept is very clear that uh, bryophytes cannot be further divided into a specialized mosses which are uh, now termed as bryophyta. So previously there was a myth that uh, all bryophytes were in, in, was of a single origin. So it was termed as monophyletic. But uh, the, the concept doesn't say so. It is paraphyletic in concept. So a new rank, means name that superphylum has been proposed and it has been accepted worldwide that the name is monosporangiophyta instead of bryophyte. So people means, who are new to this field, who want to pursue their career in this field or want to deal with bryophytes, it's the old name, they have to follow this new term. I know that it is hard to means, uh, have the term monosporangiophyta and it will take some time to uh, to mug up that uh, the term. Uh, the thing is that uh, it's new concept. Next. My presentation is uh, divided into five parts. Some is brief history of graphics then collection and preservation, identification, diversity in India, and my experience here. Yes, here in my uh, presentation, I will give more interest, emphasis on collection and preservation and identification because uh, this collection, preservation, and identification and bryophytes is little different than angiosperms and other cryptograms. So coming on to definition, of monosporangiophyta, they are actually going to almost be knowing this, but uh, to start with, I have to give a brief introduction. So I am doing so. Uh, uh, monosporangiophyta are archegoniate. You must be knowing they have got archegonia. They are atrachiate. Uh, they lack vascular tissues. They are simple cryptograms and having distinct as well as heteromorphic alteration of the generation. All of us be knowing all those points, but uh, to deal with, I have um, I just put on this slide. Next, the salient features of monosporangiophyta. I am using the term monosporangiophyta uh, now. On. The monosporangiophyta only extant plants where gametophyte generation is dominant. They have got unbranched sporophyte. For this unbranched sporophyte, monosporangiophyta term is coming, monosporangiophyta, they have got one sporangia and the sporophyte is dependent on gametophyte. These are the salient features of monosporangiophyta or else you can uh, have the term bryophytes. Now coming on to history, uh, you must be knowing Eckler was a German scientist who divided the plant tea into two kingdoms, Cryptogania and Phenomena. This is, this is 
all known to you. But about bryophyta, you must not be knowing that it is a compound term of Greek origin. Fishnet is uh, it represents only most confusion starts. The term bryophyta represents only the most plant at that time also and the present day also. So, and another bryophyta, it was a term was coined by Brown in 1864, but it included algae, fungi, lichens, as well as mosses. So, the present day scenario is not the same what uh, Brown has proposed. Schnipper was another German scientist uh, who gave the bryophyta rank. You must be know, knowing about the rank. He gave the rank bryophyta. And Rothmiller in 1951 changed the class names to Hepaticoxida. Those are Hepatic, Hepatic C or liver words. Anthocerotopsida, Anthocerotopsida, or Anthocerotophyta now, now it is, and Bryopsida, the moss plants. Later on, cross covered in 1957, is, uh, changed the term, changed the name Anthocerotopsida to Anthocerotopsida because uh, there, is a, there was a nomenclature problem in this, so it has been named as Anthocerotopsida. And uh, I want to add something here, means I, in my graduate classes, used to follow this cross-covers classification because that was in our syllabus. No specific uh, classification was uh, there afterwards. So we uh, misread this cross-covers classification. So in a nutshell, now Munas uh, Phyta has three phyla, uh, having Martensiophyta, Bryophyta and uh, Anthocerotophyta proposed by different authors, uh, Candle Strottler et al., Goffinate et al., and Renzaglia et al., respectively. And I put on this Hepaticoxida, Bryophyta, and Anthocerotophyta because I read it in my uh, cross covers classification 1957, and I think uh, most of the textbooks is also oh, is following that classification only. After that, no concrete classification has come forward. Schuster made some classification, but that was not conclusive. We were just following that, but that was not conclusive. But uh, nowadays it is Marchensiophyta, Bryophyta, and Anthocerotophyta, which represents Marchensiophyta represents liverworts, or you can say Hepatic. Bryophyta represents only mosses. Only mosses. And Anthocerotophyta is only onwards. Next, coming on to habitat. Habitat means uh, where we should collect uh, bryophytes. Where we should go to collect bryophytes. Uh, they are actually terrestrial, as you can see in the first three uh, uh, photos. They are all terrestrial. The first one is uh, the Rixia patch. Second one is uh, the rural area, and the third one is Anthocerus. Those are all terrestrial plants. They grow on soil. Then coming on to lignicolas, lignicolas are uh, plants growing on undecomposed dead plants. As you can see, uh, two uh, photographs have been uh, provided over here uh, to show means the unding uh, means growing as uh, bryophytes growing on lignicolas. Next. There are saxicolas. You must be knowing that uh, saxicolas bryophytes, uh, they grow on rocks. There are epiphytic or corticolas growing on stem or bark of vascular plants. Next, epiphyllus or folliculus. There are bryophytes, small bryophytes, which grows on leaves, and the leaves are called phorophyte. The leaves are called phorophyte. I repeat the word. The leaves are called phorophyte. It is exclusive to um, epiphyllus ones. And uh, there is one uh, family, uh, mostly uh, that family is epiphyllus, known as Legioniaceae. There are other plants also, but uh, the most of the members of Legioniaceae are epiphyllus. And uh, Aquatic plants, you must be knowing aquatic plants, uh, some 
prefer water for their life cycle or uh, complete their life cycle in water those are called aquatic plants you must be knowing uh, in the textbook that which of we can see show for personata and some of them are there for the example next you must not be knowing this uh, thing they are dung or cadaver moss or they are called coprophyllas uh, this is exclusive to the family snapnesi this is exclusive to the family snapnesi there are halophytes which uh, bryophytes going on low salinity are called halophytes there are metallophytes often uh, question uh, comes in viva or uh, uh, examination that uh, uh, pro, uh, give an example of copper uh, producing uh, uh, bryophytes copper tolerant uh, bryophytes so michael newhera is there and uh, there are different uh, uh, elements Uh, the, which they can withstand some bryophytes, so they are called what meta meta lophytes. And last one is epi epizoic. Epizoic. Uh, this uh, this has been found uh, that uh, bryophytes grow on the body of living organisms such as lizards. These are not found in India, but uh, in Amazon there there are some uh, uh, reports that uh, in some lizards or chameleons they have been found. next uh, i will be emphasizing on the collection and preservation uh, portion so starting with that these are all collection equipment what we need to do collection we need a knife chisel doublet or triplet uh, hand lenses field notebooks pencil pen or uh, collection bags scrap paper preservatives camera uh, gps field micro also means uh, there are uh, places we, uh, where we cannot uh, take microscope so um, uh, this is uh, preferable but it's uh, not uh, possible always then uh, squid bottles are there uh, metric ruler is there permission uh, this is very important permission for con from concerned authority means if you are working on a pan project pan is protected area national project uh, you must be have uh, you must be having uh prior permission otherwise you could means you can end up in jail because uh, uh there means a lot of uh, policies have come uh, regarding land reservation so you need to have a prior permission uh, before collection uh, of uh, any material it's, it's not only for bryophytes it's for uh, every every group of plants then uh, coming on to field map is very nice and field guide means often we lost in uh, jungles uh, Uh, without having field guide so this field guide is also very important and these are some of the um, equipments uh, collection equipments first one is chisel as you can uh, see a field notebook a, a knife a, um, magnifying lens and a, a gps now another thing is that what to collect and how much to collect this is one of the pertinent questions uh, come in uh, uh, collecting bryophytes so first first of all we will have to collect sufficient material but we won't collect means means many material means so that uh, there is a stake in uh, conservation so means sufficient collection is needed but uh, do not over collect that is one of the major criteria and one should keep uh, uh, in consideration the conservation of the specimen if uh, there is only one patch uh, so means um, it's better to avoid or better to take uh, a small portion from the patch but uh, do not take uh, but do not collect the whole patch another thing very very important that uh, we should avoid collecting the material on the middle of the patch means every time we should collect it from the side of the patch so that it can grow forever then try to collect the whole plant means whole plant here whole plant is very necessary because uh, uh, they are they are with the rhizomes or sporophyte or um, um, male plants female plants variants are there it's we should observe that in field and and we should collect otherwise uh, means it becomes difficult for uh, the identifier to identify uh, uh, means specimen 
a device specimen without sporophytes and perians. But right. there are there are specimens which we can uh, identify uh, in the field also. So it's better to collect the whole plant, and each selection should have separate packet. It, it has got an advantage of of um, collecting separately because it doesn't get mixed. We should take that in care. This is the packet. Uh, what I am showing it to you, and uh, this is the packet. Uh, this is. Uh, that I am pointing out to my uh, cursor. This is a nine by eleven brown paper packet, which is folded to the final herbarium packet, which comes to six into four inches. Six into four inches packet. It's uh, the final packet is six into four four inches. It's a brown paper packet. Next, uh, after collection, uh, the preservation is very essential. So means uh, we put each and every batch into uh, paper packets. Into paper packets, what what I have shown you here. Uh, these are paper packets, temporary paper packets, and these are the final paper packets. So we have to air dry those packs, air dry those specimens in the paper bags, but do not sun dry it. Then it gets fragile, so air dry is very much necessary. And uh, in case of uh, wet samples like uh, thalloid bonds, Martensia, Lularia, or Anthoceros, uh, they have got lot more water. So blotting paper is necessary. And here I want to emphasize: any blotting paper is uh, good, but what I want to emphasize is that uh, BSI, as I have worked on B in BSI. Uh, they procured a special paper packets from Pune, where uh, from uh, I know only from Pune it comes, but it is a very good blotting paper. So one must try, but it is it is bit costly. And after that, the final herbarium uh, packet is six by four inches. This is I am showing it in the cut. So these are the paper packets, the temporary paper packets, uh, where it is kept uh, for air drying. Next, this is a preservation technique. Following the preservation, this is a dry preservation. As you know, bryophytes are resurrection plant. Uh, is, uh, uh, they regain their uh, uh, shape on uh, putting them in water. So this is the temporary paper packet, the first one. Having a uh, written on dry preservation, this is a temporary packet, paper packet of blotting paper used in BSI. And uh, second one is uh, the wet preservation. Mostly wet preservation are done um, in case of thalloid ones. Leafy ones doesn't require those. And the third one is the field data. We have to enter that field data in the. Um, Field only, so that it is known as field data. And last one is the final preservation. Coming on to liquid preservation, there are a uh, lot many liquid preservatives available uh, in the market. You can uh, have any one uh, for the preservation. And mostly, I want to uh, I want to emphasize that. Uh, in liquid preservation, the amount of bisol you must put. This is my personal experience, so that it doesn't uh, the alcohol doesn't evaporate and the tissue remains soft. And meanwhile, the um, uh, liquid preservations are preservatives are there, or we make it if it is not available in the market. These are the ratios. You can, uh, note that. We need to store. We need to store the packets. Means uh, this is the final packet which I have uh, shown it to you, and uh, these are the uh, points where uh, we should be taken into consideration is, uh, while making the final packet. That scientific name of the species, family name, collection number, date of collection, locality, with GPS if possible. Uh, habitat, task 
state from which it has been collected, name of the collector who has collected that, and the name of the identifier. And additional notes for uh, as such registration, color, etc. If you want to note that. Next, uh, this is storage. Uh, storage. Uh, these are kept. Uh, the uh, final packets are kept in uh, drawers, uh, air tight drawers, and uh, art boxes are also there. Um, you can use uh, paper pack, uh, shoe packets, or it's often there as you can see in the uh, second uh, second uh, this one uh, second picture. These are shoe packets where it has been stacked and kept in the alvidas. Um, foreign herbariums uh, used to paste these small packets into herbarium sheets, which uh, means which which um, means Indians uh, do not uh, prefer. Uh, of doing that because it becomes very bulky and we have got shorter um, st storage shortage so we don't uh, do that we, uh, we um, uh, do this in our own step next uh, we have to take for storage we have to uh, uh, keep in mind the moisture control uh, for that uh, we use silica gel or naphthalene balls or any fumigants um, uh, we use the more elaborate uh, herbarium care, uh, we have to care for the moisture, uh, dehumidifier and uh, silica gel is used. And uh, pest, for pest, uh, we use uh, Agral 600 and uh, we also use uh, uh, camphor, naphthalene balls. Uh, even we uh, microwave the specimen, but uh, these specimens are not used for, f uh, for future if we microwave them. So, it is not very much recommended than microwave oven and freezing is a best practice uh, because uh, after uh, bringing the collection uh, we used to freeze it for 24 to 48 hours uh, so that uh, it is environment friendly also and pest free also and we also use insect traps next coming on to identification this is uh, another important uh, aspect of identifying the graphics. This is these are essential for uh, beginning of the work. Petrus, forceps, needles, droplet bottle, slides, uh, stains, microscope, drawing attachment, micro pictography tools, ocular uh, stage image analysis software. This is the microscope uh, which I uh, used in BSI. Uh, uh, they are costly ones. Uh, uh, left hand side, it is, those are the left hand side, upper one, those are distinct micros, microscopes, and the other ones are compound microscopes. These two microscopes are very much needed. And the right hand side microscope are with image analysis software so that we can stack and we can have good images of the plants, what we have collected. Next, uh, another important uh, part of identifying uh, the specimen is the slide preparation. This is uh, very important. Uh, first, we have to prepare the slide specimens. Preparation needs a lot of time. Uh, then section cutting, then we can stain it, then measurements are required. For preparation of specimen, uh, we need, need a rigorous washing. Washing is much more required. You can uh, wash it with uh, um, distilled water, or sometimes you can use uh, hydrogen peroxide or HCl, uh, uh, dilute HCl you can use for uh, preparation of the specimen. And uh, for weighting agent, uh, such as 2% KOH are normally used. You can uh, uh, use uh, soap in the water. You can use detergent in the water. Uh, it makes a little uh, froggy and helps in, uh, for, helps for Graphite uh, preparation of the sample, and sometimes leaves are to be cleared with lactic acid and uh, KOH sodium hydroxide for having a clear look uh, of the um, uh, dissected parts. Next, uh, section cutting. Uh, so section cutting we have must be knowing and section and microtome section. And with uh, mounts, cutting logs, uh, uh, pit sandwich, and chopping. And in microtome, you can uh, use 
freezing microtome or regular microtome uh, as of your wish but uh, what i uh, suggest uh, uh, doing a section uh, in microtome it take not many days uh, to do that in microtome you don't have the phd scholars do, doesn't have uh, so much time on spending on microtome section so uh, i prefer hand section only so means any anything you can uh, use that's up to you and there are some preservation are there preservation mounts are there there are permanent mounts and uh, in permanent mounts we uh, means mostly use xylem and in semi permanent there are lot too many uh, agents are there you can use as a semi permanent and mounts glycerin is there uh, gum arabic is there hair solution is there lactophenol is there these are all uh, you must be know uh, very familiar with lactophenol and these are all semi permanent uh, mounts uh, and semi uh, as you can see uh, i have pointed it out here uh, the uh, the stain, the stains which are used for stain which are used for uh, leaves capsule wall and uh, spores this uh, means anything it is uh, used in uh, normal biology uh, classes uh, in uh, bsc and msc you can use anything uh, for better look of the specimen next coming on to the taxonomic parameters of liver growth these are the taxonomic parameters of liver growth this what we look means uh, this are color of the plant the branching Uh, means I will show pictures on that. Means uh, don't uh, feel that uh, uh, means if you are not understanding anything. But uh, means I will show pictures. It uh, stay by it. So color is essential. Uh, branching is essential. Stem, leaf arrangement, leaf lobe, leaf lobule, oil bodies. This oil bodies is very important character in liver bodies. This is only found in liver bodies. Um, mostly easy liver wash, not color liver wash. Under leaf vegetative reproduction, sexuality, androecium, gynoecium, and so on. These are all the parameters we look uh, in uh, liver wash. Leafy liver, mostly leafy liver. Then coming on to mass uh, mosses, uh, all the characters what we have uh, encountered in uh, uh, liver wash, leafy liver wash. In addition to that, what we uh, See what we observe uh, in mosses are the transverse section of the seta, the longitudinal section of the sporophyte, operculum, and the peristome tip. And you must be knowing uh, means uh, the classification uh, of moss is based on the uh, peristome tip. Means I need not to go, go on into detail of that, but uh, we look into all those parameters. Uh, lastly, the parameters of onwards, uh, the plant dimensions where we color, which we mostly observe, uh, thallus, sexual propagules, sexuality, androecia, gynoecia, sporophytes, spores, and pollinators. These are very important. And uh, often the question comes: What is the difference between uh, elaters and uh, spuro? Uh, means spuro elaters. Uh, spuro elaters are only found in uh, uh, on words. In on words, the spores and spuro elaters are very much important. Are one of the key characters to uh, identify the uh, on words. And here is the very essential. Same. Sir. Now coming on to color, uh, the first slide you can uh, see that uh, all are uh, green in color. All specimens uh, are green in color, but uh, there is a catalog, a sample catalog. So if there is a specific number to that, you can write dark green or light green or yellowish green, anything you can write. But there is a number you can specify that. And the other two ones are the brownish ones, and the middle one, last row, middle one is fully brown. So color is much important. Coming on to stem, as you can see, there are uh, uh, a number of stem uh, section has been uh, displayed. I mean, stem section is very much essential. Coming on to leaf arrangement, this leaf arrangement may be of three types: uh, contiguous. Imbricate and distant, 
and these are very familiar uh, these are familiar ones and in imbricate there are two uh, uh, subdivision structure one is incubus and in succubus this all characters are much important for identification of a family genera as well as species these are the slopes uh, i have named them a few few of them uh, lepidosia anastrophila scapania scapania is uh, as uh, characteristic you uh, means you can um, uh, identify scapania in the feet only because they have this complicated type of leaf those are not under leaf these are leaf only but it is complicate bilobed leaf it is named as complicate bilobed leaf coming on to leaf lobule as you can see these are leaf lobules the small the shaded portions of leaf lobules and they vary in uh, shape they vary in size uh, and uh, the uh, But morphology also you can see when uh, legionia has got uh, a different morphology uh, in corolegionia has got different morphology see corolegionia they are have two corolegias but uh, the uh, leaf lobule vary there are two radula but the leaf lobule vary by such those by uh, such characters we can uh, means uh, observe uh, we can identify we can identify the different species of the genus Uh, this are leaf surface uh this here i want to just emphasize this last row they are all of legionia tree but uh, look at uh, the ornamentation is all are different all are different species so leaf surface character is also very important i want to under leaf i was saying uh, two types of under leaf are one uh, means Uh, cellular and one are not cellular. Uh, as the cellular ones I am showing, they are very small, very small. So we have to illustrate that in uh, 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 cellular. Cellular we have to illustrate it cellularly. And there are big uh, under leaves are there. Means uh, we have to we can draw it uh, means in the camera sitter. oil bodies what i have uh, mentioned oil bodies are uh, membrane bound structure uh, these are only observed in living materials that is not uh, essential uh, if you uh, means uh, and bring uh, collect the specimen from onacha lord sikkim and if you bring it to hotter region uh, here in calcutta means in one or two days uh, uh, oil bodies are gone. so in that uh, in living materials uh, means only uh, we find oil bodies and uh, oil bodies have uh, certain uh, certain uh, compounds the diterpenoids lipophilic aromatic compounds are there and here you can also see uh, the, the oil bodies vary in number color texture all and it provides a considerable taxonomic value Uh, for identification of the species as well as the genus next these are vegetative reproductive bodies uh, first three are uh, gemma uh, as you can see the morphology of gemma is different and uh, the last one is a root branches which is exclusive to the genus drepanolegionia so um, if you find uh, uh, root branches so we can easily uh, say that it is of diplomation now coming on to sexuality sexuality monoecious and dioecious is uh, as you know means uh, i am not going to that detail there is androecia there are two things i want to mention in androecia one has to look out two aspect one is whether the androecia is uh, terminal or intercalate and another thing uh, whether the male bracteoles are throughout as you can see are throughout or only at the base or there is uh, means no male bracteole is there this is also one of the essential characters of uh, andesia next coming on to gynesia these are different uh, gynesia of different genus Uh, having bracts and uh, bracteoles these are all bracts the upper row o is all bract and uh, the lower row of uh, bracteoles 
Then, coming to it, uh, as you can see, there are perianth. Uh, first row is perianth, and the second row is a transverse section of the perianth. Uh, what we observe uh, uh, is uh, without plicky or triplicate or quadruplicate, or the plicky is having um, some signs or not. This is all we have to take into consideration. And lastly, the spores. Uh, these are the same pictures, uh, and the. Uh, It depicts the veruki and the, how the veruki is being arranged. These are all essential characters. Now, field photographs. These field photographs are very essential. Uh, field photographs. I will come into detail means later. The field photographs means one has to take the field. Photograph. As you can see, this uh, the left hand side uh, is a leaf showing numerous plants are there and. Uh, Enlarged portion is uh, is being provided at the uh, bottom uh, left hand side. There may be four to five plants. So column is there. Uh, these are field photographs of some periants. Uh, uh, left hand side upper hand is and so there are selectors. Uh, right hand side upper one is conosepala. Uh, uh, there are many others. And uh, and I uh, there are some specific characters uh, which we can observe and say that uh, through field photographs that uh, uh, it goes to mainly to these channels. Uh, suppose in Australia, as you must be knowing, Australia there's a name comes uh, come it comes from the name Aster. Aster means fish, and when you touch the uh, plant in uh, the field, if you, you will find fishy smell. So these are the leafy liverwort photographs in um, under microscope. Uh, it looks great, but uh, it needs time to uh, this photograph. This is complete. It is not. So I am providing this uh, uh, line diagrams to you. The This one, this one is Andresia. These are spores. These are elaters. These are capsules and many more. This what we have done till now, right from the stem, the leaf, the leaf lobule, the enlarged, uh, uh, you know, the enlarged uh, uh, spores, uh, elaters. It's all we used to. Draw it through camera lucida, and we just make a plate. Those were those we call it as line diagram plates. Next, these are all line diagrams. Uh, and as uh, Jayanti Madam uh, mentioned, that uh, uh, Kenas has been discovered. Uh, this is the the right hand side one is the the left hand the left hand side one is the uh, the Kenas. And the right, uh, right one is the new species under Plesiogala that is Plesiogala. These are the photographs. So, every photograph is very much important. So, these are two photographs. These are all line diagrams uh, which I want to uh, show. Means how we make it. it is uh, not very easy to make this uh, type of uh, line diagram. And these are the two lamina. It's new to India. Uh, these are line diagrams. These are also new. And uh, this is a comparison I want to compare it as a public. So. Uh, means this is the comparison. Both are very much essential for for good publication, for publication in a good uh, journal. After this, uh, means you can consult. After this, uh, after this, you can uh, describe all the notes what you have uh, taken. Then uh, you can consult literature. There are the literature which I have mentioned. Few of the literature. These are all a uh, comprehensive work on India. Uh, means Indian Cordillera, Indian Horn uh, Wars, Indian Lepidogeny. Uh, Lepidogeny, Lophologeny of India. There are uh, certain autothylers uh, has been done by uh, my uh, guru, 
Dr. DK Singh, uh, means you can see the illustrative uh, drawings. Indian Polygenia is there. This, these are all uh, important literature which can help for, uh, which will help in identification of the specimen, what you have collected, uh, preserved, and so far what we have done. And uh, this is uh, the latest one is uh, Indian Depanologenia has been done in 2016. For that, that uh, means uh, no concrete uh, thing has come. In, in future, I think it will come. These are the books uh, published so far. Uh, means all the books are have it, uh, have been my guide. Uh, my guide has uh, done it. Uh, this is uh, one uh, hepatitis and anthocyanosis of Great Himalayan National Park. This is Epiphyllus one. This is only Epiphyllus one. You can imagine only Epiphyllus plant have got a uh, book. This is the checklist of uh, newly checklist of India. You can avail that um, to uh, have a view that uh, what are the uh, plants available in India till date. And uh, this is a manual of liverworts and hornworts of uh, Himachal Pradesh. Uh, one of my seniors is there. And now, uh, briefly, uh, centers of biology in India. Botany Reserve of India is a good center. Department of uh, Botany, Lucknow, where Actually, a lot many specimens are there, uh, type specimens. CSI, NBRI, you must be knowing, uh, this is one of the center. Department of Botany in uh, uh, Scott Christian College, Nagar is there, and the Department of Botany is a Zamorian uh, Guru Guruvayapan College, Kozikot is there. Because, but there are other um, centers also. Uh, which uh, there is a center in uh, Rajasthan, there is a center in uh, Maharashtra. But uh, my personal feeling, I don't know, means um, how long it will be preserved and uh, in uh, what efficacy it will be preserved. So, uh, better means if anybody wants to work after working or after, if you want to submit, uh, I will prefer uh, that you submit your. Uh, specimen to botanical survey media because there it will be uh, good care and will be taken and uh, for the for your for collected specimens. That is my personal opinion. And uh, Amerika of uh, world and India uh, means this is Geneva. Geneva, you must be knowing this is the uh, world largest aquarium uh, uh, of. Uh, bryophytes, I think, is in uh, is there in Japan, and in, you must be knowing that in New York Botany Garden is few, and there is uh, some uh, institute in USA. In India, LWU is one of the uh, for samples, as if you want, if you want to give samples from the uh, institute, you can uh, uh, and for PC and uh, some these are acronyms. You must be knowing that. And uh, uh, LWG is another uh, important herbaria where uh, many tax specimens are being stored. Next, coming on to diversity in India. Means uh, these are the latest figures. Uh, it's not uh, Martensiophyta and Anthocyanophyta are the latest figures. I can say because I am uh, mostly familiar with this and I am working with this, so I keep myself updated. Uh, this is uh, July's data, but a big concern of Bryophyta. Bryophyta. This number is way back. I have taken from LAL 2005. The reference is LAL 2005. And uh, you can imagine 2005, 15 years have come, no, none, no checklist have come. So, means uh, anybody want to work on bryophytes uh, are uh, always welcome in uh, uh, working on bryophytes. Lastly, uh, uh, Mr. said, uh, so, means I am putting up this slide. You must be very familiar with the map, vertical map of India. Uh, I go in Madhya Pradesh, and uh, another thing uh, you must be knowing the Mirania is where uh, it was uh, first thing. It was uh, it was from a village name as Dong, 
and it is uh, nowhere but in Anjao district. And it is very hard to go. So, when I called my uh, district, Anjao, where I have uh, walked on, and will uh, we'll take to do, to finish their work. And this is the means that I worked on, and it has six thousand one hundred ninety square kilometer, bordered by three, uh, bordered by two other uh, uh, and got uh, uh, from single to means uh, around five in how tough the uh, uh, place was, but it was very in uh, um, collecting specimens. It's a different uh, feeling. Now, uh, coming on to publication, uh, I mentioned uh, a few publications have been uh, for work. Um, um, yes, I invite uh, uh, young as well as uh, one to work on uh, are, uh, are always well. if you uh, want to help uh, uh, I have provided my uh, mail ID if you want um, and starting with uh, research sharing uh, Madam wants to emphasize on uh, I want to say a little bit on my uh, uh, research sharing uh, when I was uh, uh, MSc student, I was uh, doing taxonomy. Taxonomy means some taxonomy means uh, people used to know English. But there are different fields of taxonomy. You can take up elephant uh, taxonomy and you can write it. Uh, you can take a uh, genus form. Nobody hardly uh, you find people working on the lower groups. And I wish less number of people are working on fungi. Uh, uh, side by side of uh, bryophytes means in Taxonomy, and then started my so Molecular biology is bad. It's a plant or an animal to work out. It is a tool. And uh, lastly, these are my publication. Lastly, I want to acknowledge uh, my teacher. Uh, means first thing uh, means important to me. So, Madam. Uh, uh, sir and uh, Minakshi, Madam, was uh, related to my foundation in my uh, college, and uh, I want to acknowledge uh, Professor Andy Pariyama, is a very well-known uh, uh, university in my MSc and uh, um, and he uh, mentor uh, for that I took up uh, English from taxonomy as a special paper in that and the teachers of you uh, have to have taught me um, in uh, for two years uh, and next uh, Dr. is my main uh, have a lot uh, from him uh, 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 
So, uh, next, uh, Dr. A. Mao, you must be knowing that he is a director, uh, present director of Portugal Survey of India, but uh, when I did my first shoot in Arunachal Pradesh, he was with me. And uh, he uh, uh, told me many small tricks means to uh, overcome in uh, the speed. Dr. Privy Prasanna um, should be uh, because he was uh, in charge of uh, Central National Herbarium and helped me a lot. And uh, he reminded me that problem comes in the and uh, him at any time. He's uh, uh, to help. Is my uh, uh, is one of the retired scientists. I am very obliged to him uh, because uh, it's all the nominee is the problem because uh, there's that nominee, some it's a portion there is a nominee in problem like of takes it from uh, 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 I say is uh, to be a She helped me a lot in the presentation and provided me some images uh, for presentation. guide a lot during my is my I uh, students who have helped me a lot and uh, they are my students sincerely and uh, thank you can you hear me sir yes now i can hear you there seems to be some network issue due to bad weather. Your voice was breaking during the session. Um, my deepest yeah. apologies to all participants. Sorry for the technical glitches you all had to face during the session. Uh, thank you, sir, for the awe-inspiring talk. Uh, sir, shall we now uh, take a few questions from our participants? Uh -huh, you can take. I took a bit uh, longer, I think so. No, no, sir. Uh, yes. <laughs> Yes, sir. Um, could have when the technical problem was there, I could have stopped over there. We didn't want to interrupt you, sir. <laughs> okay, okay. Please go on. Thank you, sir. Uh, our first question is from Nancy Malotra. Uh, the question is, if paper packets are not available, what is the alternative source to collect the bryophyte? If uh, preferably blotting paper is uh, better, and if you don't have blotting paper, you can uh, take the brown sheet, but staple it uh, nicely. You can make a paper packet over that. If you don't have that brown sheet, also you can uh, use the newspaper also. Okay. Thank you, sir. Our next question is from Rashmi Pallavi. She's asking, uh, what are the recently discovered species in bryophytes? Uh, there are quite a few, means then I have to means, uh, see and tell it to you correctly. There are quite a few, means from India and as well as from the world. It, uh, the number keeps on changing, keeps on increasing. And uh, so, means it's uh, very hard to tell at the present uh, scenario what is the exact number. But it's going on. It's a, it's a gradual process. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, next question is from Anindita Banerjee. 
uh, question is with the help of which primer molecular analysis bryophytes can be studied uh, primer yes primer molecular analysis bryophytes can be studied bryophytes uh, can be studied actually i am not working on uh, the molecular aspect of it i have to see that I means so which primer exactly to precisely if i want to mention then i have to I means uh, uh, see that sorry to I means <laughs> not answer your question okay. um we have uh, another question from our uh, participant swear is asking it is very difficult to do wet preservation of anthocerus due to its soft nature can you suggest any method to do this but it's very easy means you take a blotting paper uh, you take a blotting paper you uh, you scoop up the anthocerus or the anthocerophyta plant a uh, handful or uh, sufficient material if you want to take you scoop it you just keep that plant into that blotting paper and just cover it just press it slightly it will soak all the water in rainy seasons you have to uh, means uh, give more time like 2 uh, 3 days but uh, ensure that no fungal infection is there Okay. If, if uh, blotting paper is not available, if you can take three four uh, newspaper also to soak that plant, and you have to keep on changing the places. Otherwise, uh, it will be dampened and um, uh, fungal uh, fungal infection will be there. Okay. Thank you, sir. Our uh, next question is from Dr. M V Suresh Babu. Uh, sir is asking. what do you know about the antimicrobial property of bryophytes there are uh, many such uh, reports of antimicrobial uh, activity uh, that uh, i haven't mentioned over here because uh, it was it comes under economic importance if you want, if you want to know uh, much more on that means i can help you out but uh, means not in this forum because this was meant for only for collection and preservation and identification and of that is that is a different aspect but reports are there okay reports sir are there. thank you sir we have another question from uh, dr suresh he is asking can you give some recommendations on uh, collecting bryophytes in the canopy of trees Ha, canopy of trees. You can uh, yeah, you have to scoop it out. You have to take a uh, wash bottle, uh, squid bottle, to moisten the uh, plant. Uh, plant growing on the uh, bark bark of uh, the tree. You have to scoop it out over there. Means uh, that actually means uh, if I would be on field, I can show you. But uh, how can I show you uh, now? It's just you have to scrape it through the knife. and have to uh, keep it uh, um, in a separate packet uh, that's all uh yes sir thank you sir we have a question from santosh sibon uh, uh he is asking if you know any database for bryophyte identification there is there is no database molecular identification is is uh, not very prevalent in india means in bryophytes as uh, this one has to be sure means is uh, they are doing molecular but which plant they are doing molecular means most of them doesn't know means you have to uh, suppose means i am giving you an example uh, you know a mango plant so if you if you know a mango plant uh, means it's very easy to uh, do a sequencing of a mango plant but if there are several mango plants because there are several varieties of mango available in the market if you doesn't uh, know about the variety means what you are doing is your result won't be wrong so first of all you need to have a identification your means good identification correct identification then you go for molecule if people uh, often think that uh, means uh, we the uh means morphology or taxonomic uh, person doesn't do you know, means do anything but that is not the case we will uh, first you identify the plant correctly then you go for molecular analysis 
and uh, regarding your question means you can uh, visit nic for uh, for database Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. We have another question from Vivika Krish. She is asking, can you suggest any medium for net preservation of bryophytes? Any medium? It, can you suggest any medium for net preservation of bryophytes? First, I want to ask uh, that person, uh, but I will answer. Uh, there are two possibilities over there. If anyone wants for personal use, Is to keep that uh, for showing uh, student. Means these are the weight production uh, preservation. That is a uh, one issue. And for another issue is there that for uh, future students. These are the two aspect. In these two aspect, the weight preservation will be different. One is for short term preservation, and one will be for long term preservation. Am I clear? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. We have a very interesting question from another participant, Roshni R. She is asking, is Sanjeevini a bryophyte? No, it's not a bryophyte. Sanjeevini is a, actually uh, Sanjeevini. Uh, people used to say Sanjeevini uh, as Selaginella. We also knew that it's it was Selaginella, but it is uh, it is. Proof that it is it was Selaginella, the Sanjeevini water uh, that uh, there it is in the story, but uh, but many myths are there that people use this term Sanjeevini uh, uh, Sanjeevini for different plants. Mostly uh, biophytes also means many of them use this term Sanjeevini, but it, specifically it is for Selaginella. In which is a bacterial uh, fight. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Another question from uh, Satya Jitra is asking: What is the ecological significance of bryophyte? It has got a very, very ecological significance. Most of uh, as uh, it helps in soil formation. What the soil, the pioneer, you must be. Uh, uh, reading or teaching in your uh, classes that the pioneer. Our uh, uh, pioneer soil formation uh, is uh, provided by the action, that means weathering action, as well as for decomposition from the mosses. Means a uh, lot many, most of them are ecological, uh, ecological. Uh, most of them are ecological only. Few of them are uh, economical. There is a big difference between ecological and uh, economical. I can uh, provide you literature. A uh, lot many works are going on uh, in ecological aspect of uh, bryophyte, and they provide uh, they maintain the humidity. Is uh, one such example is that you go for, to Sikkim and uh, Darjeeling. Uh, they pro um, this bryophyte means restore the moisture. So that uh, means the there the rainfall is uh, much more. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sorry, participants. Due to time constraints, we will not be able to take any more questions. Oh, okay. Thank you, sir, for taking all the questions and answering them with participation. From your talk, we could learn a lot about diversity of bryophytes in India. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you for this conference. We wish you all the best, sir. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. And uh, means anyone wants to know anything, just you can means uh, drop a mail to my mailbox. You can uh, I have provided my mail. Uh, means uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Man. Now uh, we move on to the next session. To introduce our next speaker, I invite Dr. Parvati M, Assistant Professor, Department of Botany, Mount Carmel College. Uh, over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Sandhya. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So it is my privilege to introduce the second speaker of the day, Dr. Shyam Kumar M. 
Dr. Shyam Kumar is currently an associate professor, BioX Center, School of Basic Sciences, Indian Institute of Technology, Mandi. Dr. Shyam Kumar had done his PhD in plant sciences from the University of Oxford, UK, and worked as a postdoctoral fellow first at the University of Oxford with Dr. Lee Sweetlove, and later at the University of Bath, UK, with Professor David Leake and Professor Michael Danson. Sir's broad areas of expertise are plant and microbial metabolism, phytochemistry, metabolic systems biology, metabolomics and fluxomics, and agrotechnologies. Sir has received several awards such as Distinguished Teacher Award 2017 from IIT Mandi for sustained performance and excellence in teaching. Earlier Early Career Research Awards, SERB ECR Award to name a few. Dr. Shyam Kumar has also executed prestigious projects of national importance, which includes ECR SERB, DBT BMBF, Imprint, Spark, and PharmaZone. So has published his research work in several high-impact international journals, such as Journal of Experimental Botany, Plant Physiology, etc. Sir, it is a great honor to have you with us today to deliver a talk on the topic how and why to investigate plant metabolomics. Over to you, sir. So, good afternoon to one and all. Thanks for the for the introduction. I really, I really appreciate uh, the time being spent wisely uh, in hunting the plant treasures. So, uh, let me first of all share my uh, my screen. So, is is my screen uh, visible? Can, if someone can uh, reply, then I can continue. Yes, sir. Can you put it uh, on slide mode? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. So, yeah, uh, as, as the title suggests, uh, today we are here to investigate plant metabolomics. Uh, what, why is it actually ne uh, needed and uh, how are we going to do this? So, these would be the two important facets. So, uh, in the process, what I would be, I would also do is uh, would introduce various case studies which can be of uh, of relevance to uh, to uh, to one and all here who are whoever are listening. Uh, categorically, I feel this talk would be of interest to uh, undergrad uh, scholars as well as uh, post uh, uh, MSc, uh, say botany or uh, biotechnology scholars. Okay, so. Before starting, what I wanted is uh, because uh, we had an exciting talk about bryophytes uh, of their significance, uh, as well as since last two days, people have been uh, listening about hydroponics and uh, and various others. Uh, here, I would uh, I would ask or encourage everyone to just uh, give few, um, take few minutes in order to see what this picture is. As you can see here, the picture is um, uh, there is a lollipop-like bottle in the center. Uh, something green is present in there and you can see rest of the thing uh, looks very familiar the flask uh, as well as there is some liquid inside it you can see some light and so on i think uh, the scholars by now might have imagined what this could be uh, if you if you have really thought that the green one is uh, some sort of algae you are right it is uh, it is chlorella okay and uh, the light here is uh, this is an experimental setup which has uh, actually rewarded a Nobel Prize. Okay, so what exactly is happening here? A light source is being given, followed by that, um, uh, the chlorella, which, which are photosynthetic organisms, they are capturing the light, and then even eventually they are metabolizing uh, and taking up the CO2, which is being, uh, uh, which is being further uh, uh, getting into the plant, uh, and, um, and eventually, uh, from the source, it is uh, various zinc metabolites are being formed. So, uh, just to um, uh, just to give an overview, I've just labeled them. Like say, uh, in this experiment, the scientist has actually used 14 CO2 uh, 
uh, which is one of the radioisotope of, uh, of our uh, 12CO2, which is present in the nature. So this 14CO2, when it is uh, available, obviously uh, in the presence of light, the plant system uh, like chlorella would eventually, uh, would eventually try to capture it. So it captures it and then it makes a range of small molecules, phytochemicals, metabolites, you name it, it makes all of them. Why? It makes so that the cell itself can sustain metabolism. It can um, divide itself, the cell theory. Every cell wanted to really uh, produce more of, the, of their own. Uh, and in the process, uh, it has to uh, depend on various uh, chemical processes uh, as well as enzymatic, uh, enzymatic activities. So in this case, Rubisco uh, does the job of fixing the CO2 and then eventually the, uh, the photosynthesis happens. The, the, by now, you might have understood um, what, what pathway I'm speaking about. Now, uh, in this one, one more uh, point where you, uh, which could be of interest is the ethanol which is being used here in order to kill the cells and quench metabolism. Why is it needed? Uh, that is really important to stop the metabolism so that, so that all the small molecules which are being produced by the system can be analyzed. Now, 14 CO2 being radioactive, uh, if you find some radioactivity even in the ethanolic extract, then one, should, one can really assume that uh, the metabolism was successful. So this gentleman, Professor Melvin Calvin, uh, was awarded Nobel Prize in uh, Chemistry, 1961, mainly for his research on uh, the CO2 assimilation in plants. Uh, and the, the pathway which he discovered uh, is, uh, is named as the Calvin cycle. So how did he, how did he manage? Uh, was, was he really having uh, great techniques um, or technologies? No, in fact, it's not. They, the, um, it's, it's more about the thought process. If you look at the uh, how they have done it is that by that time, the chromatography technique, probably it is a part of uh, the undergrad course as well as postgraduate course where we are looking at uh, chromatography, may it be paper chromatography, thin layer chromatography or so on. Uh, the ethanolic extract in this case uh, can be taken and uh, if you look at the figure A, um, they're spotted onto a particular spot and then you use a solvent which would flow up the paper Okay, along with the solvent, depending on various principles here, uh, the various, the, the mixed sample will have various small molecules. These molecules get separated out. So this, separa uh, this separation of these molecules, once, uh, when you go to figure number C, you can invert the plate or you can invert the, uh, the chromatographic paper and run it in the second dimension with a different solvent. Then whatever overlap, um, overlap, metabolite peaks or small molecule peaks are there, those will get separated as well. Eventually, you may, you will get uh, a distribution of different colors in this case. Now, each color can represent a phytochemical molecule. So, what happened in the, in this uh, particular experiment? So, if you if, um, because this is radioactive, um, you know, if it is if anything is radioactive, then uh, you put an X-ray film on it then there would be um, uh, there would be a way by which you can actually see what is the extent of uh, radioactivity in a particular uh, spot that can be measured by a technique called as autoradiography so here uh, in, the, in the autoradiography the, the, uh, when the cells are only exposed for 5 seconds the scientists have found that uh, the the pga which is uh, uh, phosphoglyceric acid um, that region has got very high amount of radioactivity. Just imagine. So, if, if you feed it for longer, for like 30 seconds, the same cells, uh, the radioactivity has uh, is widely distributed. You can see there are several black spots like glutamic acid, triose phosphate, sugar phosphates are formed, uh, serine, glycine, because photorespiration might be happening and so on. So, here, uh, 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 here, you can see how important it is to measure the small molecules or the phytochemicals in order to understand the pathway. The first product within first five seconds, which has been formed from CO2 is PGA. And that is how, because it's a three carbon compound, that's why Calvin cycle is, is also called as the C3 cycle. Now, this is how it is. So that basic fundamental experiment by Calvin led us to realize that actually CO2 fixation uh, is a very complex process wherein the CO2 enters, I mean, uh, photosynthetically is fixed by, uh, by, by, these, uh, by the plant system and then eventually carbon fixation, reduction and ribulose regeneration reactions uh, take place. 
and these are essential for the survival of the plant for that matter for the survival of us also because we depend on plant sources you know uh, the uh, plants being the primary producers photosynthesis is really important so this fundamental uh, biochemical pathways um, uh, played a major role in our understanding of uh, metabolism now uh, what happens when i say that the co2 gets uh, the, uh, if you look at the picture on the right uh, the co2 due to photosynthesis the primary carbon metabolism takes place mostly central metabolites like say pyruvate acetate um, and uh, citric acid tca cycle intermediates and so on now um, beyond that specialized metabolism happens at specialized locally i mean there is temporal as well as spatial uh, local uh, spatial activities of various enzymes leading to various valuable products and it is not same across the plant kingdom so different plants have different um, uh, sort of uh, downstream secondary metabolic routes for example take the case of tulsi it may have a range of different metabolites for, from something uh, from something like say mint in particular Uh, or there is an essential oil plants then there there may be rich in terpenes uh, there may be nitrogen rich compounds uh, like uh, nicotine or polyamines which are formed in like tobacco so these molecules are uh, being produced and this is what helps the plant to survive both the primary and secondary not only for the plants for us also these molecules are are one of the uh, reservoir or one of the reserves for various uh, useful products i'll come to that in a while so Uh, just brief uh, some definitions in fact uh, as i'm saying small molecules uh, multiple times what exactly are these uh, some definitions which would be of relevance for us are metabolites are actually uh, small molecules which are less than 1500 uh, dalton that would be the size of uh, uh, the weight of these molecules and then these uh, small molecules um, at a particular time point you take a particular leaf maybe young leaf or older leaf and you measure all the set of uh, the metabolites at that particular time you call that as metabolome for um, uh, is it only in the plants that the metabolites are present no in fact any living uh, living cell should be having uh, its own metabolome uh, the set of molecules uh, based on which the, the the system is functioning so when uh, typically when we uh, why we do why do we study or do these these experiments because we wanted to compare okay what is happening um, due to due to the stress or due to aging you know or or due to the effect of a drug a drug in a particular uh, microbe or a human cell if we wanted to study metabolomics we do comparisons and it we end up with so many data points or so many small molecule molecular information like on the right side you are seeing the, all those small dots are individual metabolites individual small molecules these metabolites uh, when you wanted to see what is the effect of perturbation or uh, what is the effect of stress then we call them as uh, when we compare using various complex statistical methods so these statistical methods will help us uh, define uh, what is happening to the whole system uh, and we better understand and that study is called as metabolomics because you are doing a system wide uh, study of the whole cell so various applications you can find by metabolic biomarker Uh, we ourselves are, uh, are are the proof that we can identify a mango versus a tulsi because the large the, the, the because by just uh, smelling the flavor flavor molecules themselves we can say that whether it is a, a mango or a um, or a tulsi or any other neem or something so uh, like that various diseases have different uh, different markers similarly various plant systems have different markers a plant when it gets infected with a pathogen it may release it may have a set of different markers which may help us in identifying whether this is infected or whether it is healthy and so on it is used in nutrition the small molecules have got immense roles for example flavor vanilla for example is a very good flavor molecule uh, it is pro, it is uh, one of the natural products uh, it this information will help in uh, better crop development um, drug candidate uh, we can uh, we can um, uh, develop various drugs i will come to, uh, with few examples uh, and also um, of latest people are doing lot of rational metabolic engineering uh, mainly in order to improve our crops uh, towards a targeted uh, uh, targeted phenotype now how do, how does this help us this understanding metabolism will help us for that we definitely wanted to use uh, uh, various techniques and in this case um, the plants being sessile 
uh, they they encounter so many uh, varieties of stress whether it is biotic abiotic you know uh, heat cold with changing climate uh, this uh, the botany um, uh, scholars will be uh, one of the most sought after already because of the climate change environment world health organization or uh, you you look into the global uh, global organizations um, the the plant biologists are well uh, required uh, you you may be following q botanical garden for example you can see a lot of activities do happen where they study about the effect of gene manipulation in in field trials for example so uh, in india itself we had like this bt cotton uh, studies uh, golden rice studies so these all needs uh, subject specialists so here uh, we one one may be very keen to know what is happening uh, to my particular crop uh, under different uh, stresses whether it is uh, due to biotic or abiotic um, and then plants are very smart they generally evade the stresses by producing various molecules if you know those molecules uh, up front you can use these molecules in order to protect your your plant as well so if you, if an insect doesn't like a particular chemical you may uh, but the plant plant can metabolize it then you can use it as a spray uh, and use it as a biocontrol agent that is possible to do so um some uh, example so that uh, we can really connect with why why do we need to study uh, plant metabolism or, or metabolomics in particular uh, you can see here uh, some plant products like say tobacco uh, it's widely used uh, but there are chemotherapeutic agents like podophyllum peltatum is used for atop society uh, okay then there are like uh, hybrid poplars uh, eugenol if you look at it's a specialty chemical there is also biofuel candidates uh some precursors are, are produced by plants which can uh, lead to biofuels and other uh, bio manufacturing uh, uh, polymers um from these precursors uh, limonene is a very good solvent used in various uh, applications paints as well as and so on uh, you can use like terpenes uh, are, are are generally used uh, not only that uh, in order to produce uh, these in uh, large scale quantities uh, people have um, uh, started expressing this plant natural products even in microbes take the case of artemisinic acid i think most of you have studied uh, that uh, or might have heard about uh, how the artemisinic acid story um, uh, when it is expressed in e coli the main precursor um, uh, it it revolutionized uh, the co the cost has been has come down so much that the anti malarial uh, compound is now available at some rupees if not in uh, thousands okay so this uh, understanding the plant uh, metabolism as well as uh, the various products uh, and their activities um, and the and the and the pathways uh, which leads to this production would be invaluable resources for us and we plant biologists have are the are well placed in order to really leverage this advantage vanilla as as another example uh, where uh, one has to do pollination i mean um, you, you have to do manually you have to do the pollination or else a particular specific insect only does the pollination so this may become impractical as uh, due to various uh, reasons in that case uh, these can be expressed in uh, in heterologously in other organisms so these are some of the uh, examples now the uh, is it only those uh, there are several other complex things like say um, made, uh, which are uh, which have have been demonstrated to uh, function very well in as medicines nutrition and fiber uh, a few example are some anti cancerous compounds like paclitaxel okay anti malaria like quinine uh, which is also recently being uh, due to covid also people started um, uh, using using it uh, it is back in news uh, artemisinin uh, as uh, uh, just now i presented uh, you look at the uh, liquorice uh glyceric acid it is used um, used in tea and other uh, this one uh, and when it comes to fiber you use cellulose cotton cotton cloth for example again uh, with the, with the latest masks and others uh, cellulose has, uh, has played a major role is already playing a major role um, and, and uh, if you can also say it as nutrition uh, when you when you say vitamins uh, pro vitamin a and so on so plant becomes very uh, versatile organism uh, uh, which are uh, uh, which are which play a significant role in everyday life of us so what more can you say about this these are in fact the treasures so as the as the workshop is rightly uh, titled uh, exploring the um, the plant treasures uh, here are the treasures so how do we measure these treasures how do we capture how do we capture this plant metabolic treasures just think of it we do have sensors 
so our nose can sense something but we but unfortunately we can't sense everything there are small molecules which we can't sense so then we have to depend on various platforms or uh, various analytical techniques which can sense which can actually detect so for that before going at um, going and simply um, simply um, trying to do the analysis one should ask a question your biological question is really uh, critical why the a particular plant because somebody has used it against a disease and then they found it to be useful then you wanted to see what is the bioactive compound in that right so you have to design your experiment once you have a hypothesis or a biological question you have to design your experiment you know, how many replicates you will take you know uh, two replicates are never statistically correct three is minimum but generally for metabolomics experiment we at iit mandi uh, my scholars take at least four to six minimum most of the time they take six replicates next coming to uh, coming to the sample preparation is also critical i'll come to that why it is important um, as as in the earlier uh, calvin's experiment we saw that he used ethanol uh, in order to quench that means you have to stop the metabolism if not the enzymes are active and the substrates are becoming prior uh, some end products you know so you have to stop the enzyme activity at a particular time point in order to in order to understand or in order to analyze what are the various chemical components here and then extraction plays an important role right solvent is always essential um if people are boiling and uh, using it say in the case of artemisinin um, the boiled one doesn't work actually you have to um, cold uh, ether was used originally in order to get the uh, artemisinin okay so one has to be well aware about the chemical properties so if you are studying chemistry as a part of uh, your course it is very well uh, required in order to link up the stuff you know why and understand the chemical properties is essential to develop uh, future drug candidates as well now there are two analytical techniques major analytical techniques which i'm saying that doesn't mean that there are no uh, there aren't other uh, methods but here a uh, mass spectroscopy is one the other one is nmr uh, which is nuclear magnetic resonance these two are very widely used at the moment in case of mass spec you can go with uh, gas chromatography um, uh, followed by mass spec uh, or else uh, liquid chromatography followed by mass spec so if you are studying analytical uh, tools and techniques again they have got relevance one after it is done we have we go back to the computers i think with the covid era most of us are becoming more familiar to use uh, most of the tools so that shouldn't be a major issue for this generation at least now what are the major critical considerations if you wanted to really um, venture into this field and uh, and um, gain some expertise two important considerations one is analytical techniques you have to know about them which technique to really follow because sensitivity uh, of your analysis is a critical factor nmr uh, has is comparatively less sensitive than gcms which would be higher sensitive and lcms would be much much higher sensitive okay so um if you with an nmr in a in a particular plant extract you may find the most of the major metabolites maybe say 10 to 20 but if you do the take the same extract and run gcms you may find about 100 molecules if you do an lcms uh, you may found uh, you may find about uh, say 400 to 500 molecules so this uh, so the right tools will be required so you um, if if some of you are um, in uh, are not having this facilities uh you don't need to worry about this uh, in an indian scenario we do have centrally funded uh, analytical uh, units in different cities okay fully funded by the government and anybody can access those with a, with a minimal fund i mean you may need to pay 100 rupees for an nmr or maybe about 50 rupees for um, uh, sorry about 1000 rupees for a gcms and so on so you one can plan it and do and do their experiments it is possible to do it okay even i think uh, uh, if you are in bangalore um, then uh, uh, isc should be should be having the facility if not um, um, if you are in any other place there are several locations in india as well as in abroad uh, where there are centralized central facilities which can be used jnu for example in delhi is there iit mandi itself uh, uh, serves as a facility uh, for various users so what did we do here At, at iit mandi my scholars uh, worked hard in order to standardize uh, a general uh, profiling metabolite profiling workflow 
which would actually help us uh, in addressing various questions. I'll come to some of those examples. So the first and foremost is you have to harvest, quench, with that means uh, use either liquid nitrogen or cold methanol or ethanol in order to stop the reaction. Lyophilize, I saw in your website, you, uh, uh, your college has a lyophilizer, which is good actually. You can store your samples for in the freezer for several uh, months or years once you lyophilize your material. Do an experiment, you can collect from the fields also and then you can do that. Um, storage uh, is also important. After after it is done, uh, there are few steps depending on which analytical platform you are using. If it is a GCMS, generally we do something called as, um, uh, after the extraction, something called as uh, derivatization. We volatilize the molecule so that uh, the molecules fly across. You see there is a, there is a picture here about the, uh, uh, how the GCMS is there. There is a column, okay, there is a cylinder which is giving gas. Uh, and there is a syringe uh, using which you can uh, you can inject your sample. It gets into the system. After that, due to the uh, mobile phase of the gas, these molecules, they interact differently um, uh, uh, depending on which gas is flowing as well as which column one is using. So inside the column material, depending on that, the molecules separate out. So some molecules come out fast, some molecules come out slow. So these all are recorded in a particular uh, output file. And that file can be easily opened up. There are various or various computational tools. One, if one uh, invests, like say three four months on it, they become an expert uh, in analyzing these kind of data sets. So once you get this data, um, this is optimization. Once you get this data, there are few downstream uh, steps like baseline correction and so on. I'm not going to elaborate on them, but um, but in the future, if someone uh, were to work with me or any of my scholars, uh, we will be able to help them. Uh, and then there is various softwares uh, where one can uh, use the um, uh, in order to detect against the library because a peak comes means you don't know whether the um, it's just a peak okay so this peak belongs to what so depending on the masses and the fragments one can look back hit, hit it with the various libraries and they find it out okay this molecule belongs to uh, pinene this molecule is uh, is uh, some terpene or whatever the molecule this is glucose okay so then uh, we do statistical analysis and do some biological interpretation. As a, as a small case study, let me, let me put up a small case study so that the things become much clearer. Um, here, here uh, let us uh, take a case of uh, T metabolomics. It is done by Huleng uh, Wu et al. It, uh, in 2019, uh, there is a paper uh, where we have uh, take, I've taken it from that source. Um, and you can see uh, initially it is a, after plucking it is green. Uh, gradually uh, on drying it becomes black. So you can this first plucking and wilting are more or less green tea followed by this uh, this becomes after fermentation this becomes uh, black tea. So what is the difference between these two if you wanted to ask why this is really important I'll come to that after I uh, flag a particular molecule. Okay so you run uh, using uh, GCMS uh, or NMR or whatever you get various peaks. Now here, uh, um, as labeled here, it is caffeine, um, this is galactinol, because there is a library against which we can hit or we run standards as well. So once we get this information, you do statistical analysis, which shows that uh, how the metabolic composition or the metabolome of the particular system is changing over time. You can see that um, across the stages, they, they are clustering very different. So if had, had there been no chemical change, then they wouldn't, uh, then they would be, uh, they, they wouldn't cluster separately. They all would be, uh, would be, wouldn't be uh, separated out. They would come out as, a, as a, at the same location. But here you can see S1 till S5, uh, they are clustering very differently. So these kind of uh, statistical analysis, we call them as multivariate statistical analysis. You may write down few uh, titles like say principal component analysis. If anybody is interested by question answers, I can explain those. Um, so here, once it is done, you can also do uh, fold changes. Uh, what is the relative abundances of these molecules? And you find that uh, S1 and S2, uh, the first two uh, relates to the green tea, whereas the rest of them are black tea. Uh, black tea. You can see that the epicathecan level as well as catechin levels and epigallocathecan levels are, are directly dependent on the processing. So in green tea, their quantities are higher. And it turns out that these are the molecules which are 
which are currently docking very well with uh, with uh, human um, uh, ACE2 receptor, uh, which is one of the targets for the SARS coronavirus. Okay, so that means uh, this has been um, uh, some papers. Papers have been published by various scientists. Now uh, that would mean that this green tea can be beneficial rather than having a black tea. On the contrary, had your drug candidate would show that quinic acid would be better, then you would go with black tea than uh, rather than the green tea. You know, so this kind of information uh, plays a very significant role in order to um, uh, in order to choose we, uh, which uh, uh, which nutrients we can, one can take or what we, uh, which source would be more health beneficial. Not only that, uh, this is also related to the cost cost and uh, cost as well from the various industries. So, with that much introduction, I think you got an idea about uh, why we needed to bother about uh, small molecules because those are treasures. Uh, mainly from the plant treasures and uh, how we needed to do it I given a rough idea about the workflow so uh, now for the next few minutes what I will do is I will explain uh, what kind of activities we are doing at IIT Mandi uh, you can see the beautiful campus uh, we have two campuses south and north campus uh, nestled within the mountains um, and then um, of course uh, we have a botanical garden which, we de which I developed uh, after I joined IIT Mandi uh, in 2015 Okay, so it took us a good amount of five years. Now we are in a better position uh, with so much repository. So this botanical garden, we have a website. Some of you I would encourage to uh, go through it. Um, and then uh, we digitize the flora. We try to understand the nutritional and phytochemicals of some of the selected plants. And most of them are, uh, uh, most of them are indigenous, uh, which are uh, very relevant to this location. Okay, we are trying to understand their flora and their uh, and their usefulness as well, so that it can generate some revenue to the localites. And uh, documentation and digitization are uh, part of the uh, part of the act activities which we do, um, and it also serves as um, as a uh, outreach activity for various school visits. We do QR coding. Uh, you can identify what plant it is, what is it used. We do a lot of farmer training of uh, various crops, herbals, and so on. Uh, and plantation drives. You can see IIT Mandi scholars uh, doing plantation drives. Now, uh, coming back to the to to the topic, uh, we also study the local flora mainly uh, to look at the phytochemical uh, constituents uh, using uh, metabolomics as a tool. So today my, I will focus on some of these aspects. You can see on the left um, some medicinal plants which we are uh, studying. On the right you can see there are various Himalayan essential oils. Actually the list is very small. We do have uh, a list of more than 30 to 40, uh, 40 plant species we, uh, we, which uh, we are actually investigating. Uh, so I will divide uh, the next two case studies. Um, uh, of uh, how we are tapping the Himalayan biodiversity, mainly uh, for the phytochemical studies. And uh, after that, I'll follow how we are hunting for novel drugs, drug candidates, including uh, against the SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. So that will give us a bit of connectivity to the present day COVID era. So Himalayan essential oil or phytochemical profiling, um, uh, just, to, just in a nutshell, I'm not going to go in detail, uh, these, uh, these essential oils were found to reduce anxiety in humans. Okay, uh, of course, with lockdown, uh, lockdown also we are several of us are un, uh, have uh, encountering anxiety. Probably some essential oils may help us. Okay, uh, essential oil bath or something like that. Uh, and they have got wide applications in health and industry. And uh, literature, um, we when we did, we found that they have got immense application in pharmaceutical industries. Uh, cosmetics, food, and as uh, as well as in feed additives. Uh, feed additives. Now, not only that, when we went a bit uh, deeper into our into our research, we figured that these essential oils can be cancer preventive. Like uh, Blowman et al. has shown that which are the various uh, pathways of the um, uh, of, of the uh, cancer uh, cancer metabolism uh, or cancer signal signals uh, where these play a major role. Uh, these essential oil components. All the EOs in this left side figure are uh, showing the activity of EO either as inhibitors or either as a promoters of a particular pathway. Uh, and hence uh, we foresee, it is only 2018 paper, uh, that over time essential oil becomes a, one of the major, um, uh, major pharmaceutically uh, significant um, entity. Uh, already uh, some institutes in India are carrying uh, activity of essential oil against uh, SARS-CoV-2. 
So on the same lines, uh, one study has shown that garlic essential oil can uh, inhibit um, the uh, what is that uh, methyl allyl, I think, disulfide and uh, allyl trisulfide. These are the one uh, which are uh, which are shown to inhibit the um, SARS-CoV-2, uh, some uh, some of the main protease as well as ACE2. That's what was studied and reported in this study. Uh, this reference can be looked into for more details. So, with that much of uh, um, uh, significance, what we thought is let us get the phytochemical profile so that we understand what small molecules um, uh, uh, the Himalayan essential oils are actually having. It's not only Himalaya, we are also taking the other essential oils available in India. So, when you look into that, these, uh, these essential oils, 18 essential oils, these are the list here, like juniper twig to calamus. Uh, Acorus calamus to carrot seed oil, uh, few anything which is very common. Pine needle, I think you people can connect immediately. Lavender is one more thing. Hedicium tagetus, which is um, uh, Genda um, and um, uh, Galangal and other uh, essential oils. Uh, interestingly, we have a local industry who has uh, get, uh, who works with us closely, and they produce. They have a large scale industrial unit, uh, and they produce these pure essential oils. And we did the um, uh, phytochemical analysis on them, metabolomics. Uh, you can see one of my scholars on the on the right, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Manish. Uh, he uh, optimized the complete protocol in order to run, uh, in order to do the analysis. And uh, as I've already told, sample preparation followed by that, one has to do GCMS. Uh, that is what we have our mission. And uh, you one can do the pathway mapping and statistical analysis. So I'll come to that, how we, uh, what kind of uh, uh, results uh, he has got from this experiment. We uh, literally, we could understand uh, what are the various phytochemicals present. Uh, here, uh, juniper twig oil, if you see, uh, either uh, we used both NMR as, a, as one, more, one more method, uh, where we can detect myrcene, pinene, and cymin, or we can use GCMS. This is also NMR. Sorry, I'll go to the GCMS directly. Or we use GCMS in order to figure out what are the various molecules which are present. Like uh, you see different peak numbers and uh, different metabolites and what are their proportions. So these molecules, once we identified, they do have their own chemical structures. These structures can be taken up. Um, uh, for uh, doing various computational studies uh, uh, like docking uh, and various other aspects, whether they are toxic, predictions can be made out of it. And uh, from the localites, we ask them what they use it for. So we get a lot of uh, various uh, vital information. So we, we are currently building a database out of it and the database will be available uh, to everybody. Uh, uh, not uh, And uh, on, on similar databases are also available uh, from CMAP and other places, but we are very categorically focusing on mostly the Himalayan um, essential oils. Um, this is the, the juniper, uh, juniper twig, oil, twig oil. You can see with GCMS, the number of molecules which we are able to detect and identify are much, much higher. Uh, so many molecules. Uh, small ones we removed here, the major molecules we have uh, highlighted. Um, coming to the, um, okay, I think this is one more plant, uh, which is Aquarius calamus. Uh, a localites, they use it for various purposes, but um, uh, but mostly uh, for external, external usage, uh, they, they use it. Uh, Angelica glauca, we believe the limonin also has been shown by uh, by some study that uh, it can bind to the uh, ACE2 receptor. Okay. So, in a nutshell or in a, uh, I think I'm going a bit fast. Uh, what I'm trying to um, address here is that um, all the 18 essential oils after we studied, we found greater than 1000 phytochemicals. You can, you can see there are several names in this slide. And at least 567 are very unique. Now, one can use computational tools and others in order to find what this can be useful for. One case study, I will show how we are using. Not only that, it gives us various information about the source to sink, as I have already told, the CO2 gets fixed up. After fixing up, it enters into various pathways, and mainly you might be, you might, uh, uh, the plant biologist must be studying secondary metabolic pathways like sequimate pathway or uh, MEP pathway, mevalonate pathway. So we are able to connect that most of these molecules um, are either coming from uh, the terpenoid indole alkaloid uh, roots or from the monoterpenes, uh, geraniol biosynthesis, sequimate pathway. So these are some of the roots which uh, which uh, these essential oils are made. So if we understand the whole pathway, then and if, if one of these molecules turns out to be a 
potential drug candidate then we know which source this uh, which uh, which plant is the source for this particular molecule so maybe we uh, we may hit upon the treasure very soon uh, of, uh, of answering a, um, a of identifying a potential bioactive molecule okay so on that line on that line here is our hunt for hunt for the biomolecules hunt for the bioactive molecules mainly for uh, this study i am presenting is in relation to antivirals but we are also studying other aspects so recent uh, recent nature plants journal has said that we have to be open enough to redeploy the plant defenses you know one has to really uh, be open to explore this way because earlier uh, artemisinin did work right uh, taxol has worked as anti cancer anti malaria so there might be a molecule which might work uh, against uh, uh, against the against um, uh, various viruses for example uh, in the south as well as in many parts of india we use um, uh, papaya leaf extract for uh, for uh, against dengue in order to increase the blood platelet count now uh, one has to really uh, understand what phytochemicals are present in them and uh, how is it uh, acting i mean what is the mechanism if we can prove it then there would be uh, the potential of uh, developing a altogether a different uh, phytochemical industry uh, uh, for the, for the for uh, that particular disease okay so uh, we when we look back into literature we figured that uh, there are various quinic acid derivatives uh, in 2015 uh, this paper uh, as well as you can see dicaphel quinic acid um, uh, to treat coronavirus infection this is again very old uh, um, uh, old uh, patent uh, that means that uh, people have been working on various phytochemicals uh, which can act as potential antivirals so with that what we thought i got only few more slides uh, with that what we thought is uh, let us uh, understand what the mechanism first of all and look for various targets uh, which can dock with phytochemicals so by the time uh, some, uh, some sci scientists have worked on various structures of this uh, sars cov2 uh, proteins and mpro which is the one of the main proteases um, the main protein that particular structure was available to us so three targets we selected uh target 1 uh, which is present in the human uh, on the outer uh, membrane of the human that is tmprss2 as well as uh, there is another uh, second uh, target uh, uh, second receptor uh, the ace2 uh, um, which is uh, on the human uh, cell uh, as well so these are present on uh, inside our cell so now uh, the sars cov2 proteins they exactly dock with this i mean they uh, use these two targets in order to enter into the system so can we have a competitive small molecule which would uh, compete with the sars uh, once infection is done that uh, they uh, enough as2 receptors will not be free for the sars2 to, to dock you know that is the that is the hypothesis here so we thought uh, let us also take a uh, one of the proteins of the sars and these two receptors and try to dock various uh, himalayan phytochemicals Uh, which can act as inhibitors so as an example uh, we are uh, we are talking currently hundreds of other molecules uh, one of my phd scholars shagun is uh, doing the job here where uh, she gained expertise in docking studies and so on so we as an example i have taken epicathecin quinic acid caffeyl quinic acid here you can see the structures are very complex with several hydroxyl groups which are required in order to dock uh, interact with the with the uh, target molecules uh, in their active site and uh, we took a uh, camostat as uh, one of the no which is already reported and known inhibitor uh, which is giving a binding energy of say minus 6.5 mg whereas uh, some of the molecules which we talked against the same protein gave us uh, 0.4.43 uh, minus 4.67 they may not be as good as camostat but still these two molecules for example if uh, if they are being taken up as natural products they may synergistically may be uh, may do the job for us we don't know until we do in vitro tests but the first step is uh, to find to come out or to filter uh, or funnel out uh, potential candidates from hundreds of molecules that's what we are doing at the moment so overall uh, the goal or uh, how what kind of approach we are doing is we are uh, tapping into the various uh, plant resources which we have we are study we understand their ethnobotanical uses their habitat their cultivation and we use multi analytical platforms like gcms nmr uh, lcms and so on and we do the profiling as i told why should we bother for metabolomics metabolic profiling we do 
and we are trying to come out with a phytochemical database database of our own which would be mainly himalayan specific and those would actually eventually the outputs would be we know uh, there will be similar molecules which can be anti disease you can select by against various diseases anti diabetes obesity and so on uh, as well as validation of bioactivity uh, compounds okay so one most important part here is uh, we are looking for collaborators so that we can do various validation of bioactivity especially uh, where uh, one may need uh, um, uh, bio, bio safety level 2 or 3 uh, uh, level x uh, level uh, facilities so uh, so that we can do in vitro assays and then eventually come out with potential drug candidates it is not for only until the vaccine comes even after the vaccine comes these uh, prophylactic drugs will always be very essential and maybe uh, we may need to encounter more future uh, pandemics so one should be ready for those okay i think i'm done with the talk right now what i'm going to uh, the final two slides would be about my research group so that uh, it would motivate some of the scholars to eventually qualify and and target iit mandi as one of the uh, places for their uh, higher studies um we study abiotic stress response in uh, in plant systems we also study various uh, phytopathogens and um, uh, and and symbiotic um, uh, symbiotic microbes uh, which can uh, mainly associated with the plant we study um, uh, we study uh, their metabolism mainly and their interaction plant microbial interaction and their metabolic crosstalk um just like uh, calvin uh, rather than feeding 14 co co2 which is um, radioactive we we feed 13 co2 and we try to understand the plant metabolic phenotypes um, the, the, so that is a uh, uh, some other time uh, or you can look back into my various papers uh, from in my website you will find uh, how we do something called as flux analysis or something called as uh, metabolic phenotypes or uh, or 13c tracers how we use and uh, we study phototrophic metabolism uh, phytopathogens um, also my outreach activities goes into uh, say uh, high high end projects like farmer zone which is funded by dbt it is a 10 crore worth project which i am uh, one of the co pis in that and as i just presented we are looking into phytochemicals from the himalayan biodiversity and uh, some side projects because we have an mtech program so we do uh, cellular bioprocessing based to valuables okay these are various uh, funding agencies Uh, some facilities and prototypes which we established over time since uh, within last 5 years uh, th th that's what is presented here uh, botanical garden plant uh, grow plant culture lab um, uh, some prototypes bioreactors and so on so finally i would acknowledge uh, definitely iit mandi uh, and my previous associations uh, and and current collaborators from university of oxford bath farmer zone team uh, kit in germany Uh, icgb uh, dr ranjan nanda and all my funding sources from uh, from various uh, 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 from various uh, agencies especially from the dbt uh, imprint mhrd serb spark uh, these are and also iit mandi and uh, i'll i leave here uh, to uh, most importantly to thank my scholars in fact uh, what i'm i did is only representing them here uh, most of the hard work is being done by them uh, and uh, and th that's what it is Uh, thank you very much and i'll be happy to take any questions uh thank you sir for this very informative session uh before we take up uh, the questions from the audience i request all the participants to fill up the feedback form which is posted in the chat box um kindly submit the feedback form before 4 10 pm today are you ready for the questions sir yeah yeah let's go ahead all right we have our first question from rashmi pallavi she is asking which method can we use for nmr based plant metabolomics um okay i got it uh, there are uh, multi different types of nmrs uh, which can be uh, adopted for your study mainly as a as a start one can go for the proton nmr okay just if your sample is really very complex and in very low quantities if it is available i would really recommend uh, to go with proton nmr as a as a beginning to see if the molecule which you are looking or the molecules which you are looking uh, they are within the range you know they are uh, either detectable or not 
whether it is coming at the uh, in nmr we do have a ppm 0 to 10 so if you are looking at a molecule like say which is come, which is supposed to be an aromatic compound then you may expect it to be around 6 to 8 between so whether the peak is coming there or not so you may need to find those that is one way once you get a complex mixture you may also consider purifying those mixtures maybe uh, just by separating using a chromatographic separation or uh, maybe fractionating it using uh, using other methods and then running them again back uh, using the nmr um, apart from that uh, there is other technique like say you can use 13c nmr uh, in that case your molecule should be in very high quantities for 13c nmr um, and other sensitive techniques is 2D NMR is also is also possible 1H and 13C. The only uh, challenge uh, between these different techniques is proton NMR takes you roughly only five minutes per sample, um, whereas 13C NMR you may need to give it overnight. And uh, and uh, 2D NMR again it can go. It depends on which 2D NMR you are using. Uh, accordingly, you may need one hour, two hours, or or 24 hours, or even more. So it depends on uh, the problem which you are asking uh, and, and how pure your component is. Thank you, sir. Uh, next yeah. question is from Dr. Gururaj HB. He is asking, how effective is high throughout throughput screening in plant metabolics for drug discovery? Uh, how, how efficient is it? Yes. How effective is high throughput screening in plant metabolics for drug discovery? Yeah, yeah. Uh, de definitely, I think uh, that's the question of the uh, of the time. Actually, uh, if you look at various uh, natural databases, uh, one can uh, really tap into those. Uh, now, with uh, with the advent of uh, say artificial intelligence, uh, okay, uh, I will I will structure this into three important parts. Uh, the first one uh, being the analytical platforms. If you use high throughput analytical platforms, you will you will be able to capture several molecules at the at the same go. Okay, and then I would structure it into the second aspect is how fast can we analyze this? So that is where the various computational uh, uh, computational tools uh, which are being developed using say nowadays artificial intelligence, neural networks, and uh, uh, machine learning uh, algorithms. So if one has to use those. Uh, in relation to uh, the nearest drug candidates, I think uh, it can uh, it can be very very efficient. It, I think already people are uh, proving uh, that from uh, from hundreds of molecules, we can very quickly come down with uh, top potential top ten. It is possible to do that. Not only that, if you go go into Swiss AdMed, Swiss AdMe, uh, one of the websites, if you go and give a uh, your molecule formula there. Uh, all these hundred molecules you can upload, and you can see uh, whether they are what what the predict their admit properties, whether uh, they can their adsorption, uh, their metabolism inside a human cell, whether they are toxic or not. These predictions can be done. So based on that criteria, I mean drug likeliness, you know, drug candidate likeliness can be evaluated, and that can be used in order uh, in your hypothesis, so that you can come down from lot to less, and then go into the lab and test them. Uh, I, I definitely see that high throughput is a uh, methods would be would be the way how to go ahead. Uh, given that uh, we have a repository of thousands of molecules now. Uh, thank you, sir. We have our next question from Mr. Martin P. Uh, sir is asking to understand the process of flowering, which among the above mentioned branch of metabolomics to be prioritized or to begin with. Again, again, very interesting uh, question um, uh, out of the box, I should say. The, flower, the flowering uh, itself, I think um, our civilization is dependent on that. You accept or not, the bees, the pollination and flowering are very essential. One study uh, at John Innes Center has shown, it, it, I think it went into, uh, it is published in Science, I believe, has shown that in fact uh, understanding the the signals or uh, the main uh, molecules which are responsible for flowering would be very very essential so what i feel is uh, the technique uh, to take uh, when it comes to flower understanding the flower and uh, the responses in relation to the flowering um, gcms uh, would would do well if your molecules are volatile enough Apart from that, LCMS would be the technique to go for uh, identifying the main signaling molecule, fluorogen, for example. Okay, it is also one of the one of the biochemical. 
so you i, I would believe that uh, going with these analytical platforms would help i think once some signaling molecules were identified imagine you identify a signaling molecule uh, under whose presence uh, whose presence is really essential for flowering now if you know that you know out of season you can make any plant flower by spraying it provided there would be testings needs to be done so that they won't be uh, detrimental to the environment as well as the plant um, uh, that is possible apart from that if your study is related to flower color for example anthocyanins pigments and so on i think one talk was there in relation to that um, then it becomes really fascinating because uh, this again leads to the secondary metabolism and this flower and the colors itself uh, plays a significant role in attracting the pollinators uh, and they have uh, immense role to play in the civilization too so the networks uh, the flower metabolism network uh, would be very interesting i i strongly recommend um, uh, 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 recommend to use lcms uh, one of the flowers which we routinely use in uh, himachal Uh, we recently found that uh, in one of its um, uh, in one of the corolla i think one of the organelles of the of the flower one of the organ of the flower we figured out that there is a toxic toxin which is released by the flower so that is detrimental to bees so we are trying to understand those kind of stuff as well so it is possible to do using lcms as a platform here and if it is volatile as i told gcms would would outright do the do the job for you thank you sir for your uh, the terminology i would like to state is volatile organic compounds okay sir yes and next question we have from dr raja raut sir is asking is there any confirmed specific metabolites that can be used for covid 19 <laughs> again again a uh, very relevant question uh, rightly point uh, pointed i think we keep on scanning uh, to see uh, which molecules uh, i think uh, based on the docking there are few arbitol i think is uh, is one of the one uh, which is uh, currently uh, being uh, t- at the clinical uh, trial 3 uh, several uh, repurposed molecules are docking very well but if you come to the phytochemicals uh, uh, people have shown uh, our group uh, ourselves have shown glyceric acid uh, does the job uh, uh, and our manuscript will be up in few days as well uh, there we will give, will give you few more leads uh, which uh, which can uh, which are about the potential uh, docking ability to against anti covid but now the uh, having said that whatever is true computationally may not may not always be efficient that's why i'm saying we have to funnel them out we have a list of several molecules out of that one or two may be very specific but others may not be very specific they may be um, supporting indirectly you know they may not be against sars cov2 but they may block the ace2 receptor in that case indirectly they are the sars cov2 is not getting access to a receptor in the human that will give us extra time you know that extra time is enough for the cells to generate the antibodies quickly so it's more about uh, the timelines if uh, if nobody takes any uh, potential phytochemicals probably they may uh, get all right a healthy person uh, individual may get all right uh, post infection um, within the age group what, what i mean to say is uh, maybe within 6 uh, to 7 days whereas uh, if with somebody is taking some sort of prophylactic or post infection they have taken some uh, epicathecin which is docking very well um, in our in our studies also will show that um, then uh, you may then what you may need to do is um, uh, you may reduce uh, the time of recovery uh, mainly uh, maybe 2 to 3 days or 4 days depending on uh, because your cells are getting more time you know the virus although there are one one cell which is infected is making 100 viral particles for example uh, now uh, the adjoining cells they are the receptors are not free to take them up that means the cell can is getting more time so you may get uh, cured by 3 to 4 days or 5 days so this is all speculation okay so i don't want to uh, be very uh, specific in relation to any molecule at this moment so that is the reason why we do in vitro studies in order to figure out uh, the exact uh, ic50 because dosage also is important right uh, what do we recommend epicathecin take 5 tea a day green tea or only one green tea in the morning and one in the evening or do we say okay once you got you know your test is positive take 10 10 cups up front we don't know uh thank you sir for your answer uh we have another question 
coming from Gayatri Hola. She's asking, sir, can we use this technology even for secondary metabolites? Yes, uh, all these uh, essential oil compounds uh, were our secondary metabolites, and we have demonstrated GCMS can uh, capture those. You can use it, and just uh, to clarify. Uh, to all the scholars, it's not only GCMS or LCMS, which may, which might be uh, expensive as well as uh, one may not be readily be having the accessibility. If you have, if you got HPLC, you can go with it. If not, take up L, uh, sorry TLC. If not, do paper chromatography. Still, you can be able to identify molecules. Standards you have one has to run just to confirm that that molecule is present uh, or the or a set of molecules are present. They may not be more sensitive. But still, science can go on. If you have a spectrophotometer in your lab, still you can do science with it. Uh, you can identify that. But uh, to be more relevant with your question, yes, uh, secondary metabolites can be analyzed using these platforms easily. Uh, thank you, sir. Anita P is asking, can we isolate metabolites in the exotic species? Uh, I, I missed. I missed the terminology. Can we isolate metabolites in the exotic species of plants? Uh, exo exotic in the sense uh, coming from another planet or uh, yeah, um, maybe introduced species. That's okay. Oh, you you mean okay? This is coming to the ecological perspective. Yes, uh, it can be done. Unfortunately, I think uh, Lantana camera is here in the Himalayas, so it it somehow has come from all the way. Uh, we can do the metabolic studies uh, and uh, uh, and and find out how toxic it is for the animals. Because most of the cows and others, they are eating up and they are getting diseased. So yeah, exotic species can be done. Some orchids, for example, they could be interest. Somebody has recently, um, uh, they talked just before it was interesting, where bryophytes can play a major role uh, in ecosystem. So one can see what is happening to the uh, to the phytochemical uh, recycling. You know, you can you can do that kind of studies as well. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, Arshpreet Kaur is asking, sir, what should be our experiment protocol if we want to target phenolic compounds or in particular flavonoids while carrying out GCMS or LS, LCMS? Okay. Uh, th th this is uh, the work which we are doing at the moment. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the case of, uh, if you have a uh, particular plant system which you are looking, and if you really give UVB to your plant, a pulse of UVB for for, for shorter or longer duration, the flavonoids gets very um, highly expressed. Okay, so we we my one of my scholar is doing that. So he mainly has uh, found that uh, with GCMS the flavonoids are a bit difficult, but LCMS can do the job for you. So uh, the care which you have to take is. Um, how how do you enrich your extract? Some sort of uh, enrichment of your extract using the specific columns, like all the sugars can be removed out because sugars will be in a very high quantities. Whereas your flavonoids can be compared to sugar, which is thousandfold. Uh, these uh, can be in very small quantities. Secondary metabolites are always in less quantities. So you may need to use specific columns. The same goes with plant hormones also. So you may use specific columns to enrich those molecules. Once you enrich those molecules in your extract, you know. Then the likelihood of getting the the molecule or detecting it and identifying it would be much much higher. If you take extract right up front, you will get a lot of sugars because you know photosynthetic uh, uh, the plant uh, central metabolism is always active. Central metabolites will be several fold higher than secondary metabolites unless you are doing very specific organ. You know, for example, you take uh, tri uh, trichomes. Trichomes are very rich in phenyl propanoids. So there you may get uh, with very less quantity. So you may need to do this kind of uh, analysis. And if your flavonoid is soluble in say some uh, particular solvent, I would recommend you to go be carefully look into that. And also temperature stability is another, another aspect. Uh, because um, one should realize that most of the secondary metabolites, uh, they have a specific role to play, um, whether, whether, whether in relation to stress response or so. Now, uh, they may be present in the plant as glycosides. So you, so you may need to use some enzyme in order to break the glycosidic bond and get release your uh, plant phenolics in particular and, and get the uh, analysis done. This is in relation to flavonoids or others I'm saying. Whereas if you have uh, phenols, uh, we standardized a method for GCMS of phenols. Uh, my scholar did it. 
and uh, i think that, that will will publish very soon and uh, that can be that can be also adopted for phenols mainly wall bond or free phenols both of them uh, okay. thank you sir we have a question from binimol kj she is asking is pure compound essential for nmr studies uh, pure compound essential for what nmr studies uh for stand uh, yes of course um you mean uh, absolute pure is, uh, is may not be needed in the sense uh, if you if you are if you wanted to do exact quantification then yes the purity does matter if impurities are there then you may get alternate signals splittings and so on so pure compounds are available in sigma uh, and other places but if at all you don't find pure compounds not every phytochemical is available in sigma or others many are not available commercially then you may need to find the nearest plant for example uh, i wanted to express vanilla okay uh, in a in a uh, in a bacteria or uh, in a heterologously inside another plant now i got my extract i did an nmr i got a peak now i don't know whether it is vanilla or not what i will do i'll bring a commercial vanilla maybe which is used for cake or something i would spike it to my sample now if it gives me the same peak above uh, above my sample then i know that vanilla is there earlier you know or else i will run separately vanilla and find it out how in spite of the purity i will get uh, qualitatively it is possible but if i wanted to know the exact quantity of the vanilla then i'll have to find the commercial sample or, or it must be well defined somewhere you know so that um, uh, so that i can uh, really um, uh, really do the standard curve and then find what quantities it is there so it depends again uh, on your uh, experimental requirement whether it is qualitative or quantitative yes sir we have another question from arshpreet kaur how do we prepare the extracts if we have small amount of plant material raised through tissue culture as large amounts are required in succulent extraction what are the alternatives so again very good question we we uh, encounter this very often uh, so what we do is um, uh, if um, there is a minimum amount sensitivity of the instrument comes into play here so if you have got very small samples they are very vital because you uh, we have that issue as well some experiments we do where the plant doesn't grow much very small um, by typically it is like that even bryophytes you take or pteridophytes and so some plants would be very small so in that case how would you do plant hormones for example you want to analyze the the, the quantities may be very small so we pool the samples to make at least say 10 mg dry weight so if that much sample is there there is no way we can go for succulent apparatus so what we do is we directly put the solvent uh, number one we uh, either lyophilize and have the powder and then we uh, ultrasonication we may look at alternative uh, methods of grinding it uh, like using small uh, small um, you know blades uh, blade um, uh, homogenizers um i once it is done or just boil it out once it is done we uh, we get the uh, information required i mean uh, uh, once we get, uh, do it the solvent whatever we get we under uh, vacuum we dry it so that would be the way how to go it so you got like 500 microliter you dry it completely then you add uh, under vacuum you dry it then you add about only 20 microliter so the final concentration is only 20 microliter now we use that for our further further work you know so that is how we we go ahead, uh, go uh, go ahead this problem is very routine for uh, plant biologists thank you sir that's all we have for the qa session uh, okay. thank you sir for all uh, your answers it's an absolute privilege to have you amongst us we wish you all the best thank you again sir. okay thank you very much on behalf of mount carmel college administration the principal deans of science head of the department and all faculty members of the botany department would like to express our gratitude to dr shwadeep majumdar and dr sham kumar masakapalli for sharing their treasures of valuable knowledge in plant science thank you both once again uh, with this uh, we conclude our uh, session for the day Uh thank you for your patience and cooperation